Welcome back, everyone, to the GGBL offseason. Season 5 is so close to getting started. We're almost done. Up on your screen, you see all the tender contracts. Guys, I have to do this for every single team, every single offseason. All 30 teams, i got to manually go in and do the tender contracts because CPU never likes to tender those contracts. If you don't, those guys enter into free agency. Same thing with arbitration. If a player does not have arbitration offered, he will enter free agency. So you got to take care of those two things first. Then we can do the free agent process that we love to do here. And uh, we'll spin. However, we're not doing that this time around. We decided that we were going to auto free agency, which basically means that all of these exclusive free agents that have now found a new home, like Trey Mashburn, Buddy Kidd is staying, Dom Taylor is staying, Michael Ruth is staying, all these guys have to sign up first. Because the minute I turn that on to auto... Those guys will then be probably competing with other teams on their list. And I don't want that to happen. So as we go forward, we're going to be kind of monitoring and making sure that that list gets whittled down to nobody's left other than the 84 and under players that we said will be autoed for free agency. So up on your screen, you now see the draft lottery. So the Atlanta Sting will yet again have the number one pick and the Minnesota Jacks who were in position to possibly get the number one pick have dropped down way far down that list, and that sucks for them. So they continue to have very, very bad luck. But now, guys, we're going to be doing something differently, kind of to buy some time here as we wait for the exclusive FAs to re-sign with their other teams. We're going to be doing the Rule 5 draft. We haven't done this in the GGBL Ever, I don't believe. So might as well do it now. And we have a ton of changes happening here. Ton of changes. Guys like Chu Bong. This guy has been inside the Wisconsin Maples organization for quite a long time. He'd been blocked by Matt Justice, a custom player that was pretty much entrenched into that position at first base. They've had some other guys in that organization there that have been pretty good, like Chad Presley they acquired in the Avante Duckworth trade. So they've had some... They've had a lot of depth at first base. Steve Feliz, a closer that wasn't really getting any run there with the Las Vegas Nuggets. We've got Michael Leguero here with the Corpus Christi Hooks. And then Alex Miner has been up and down with San Francisco, and he wasn't protected. So, I don't know. I just felt like allowing the CPU to kind of man the 40-man roster at this point, just, just not protect certain players that I like, certain players like Ken Jimenez, Mike Sexton, guys that you know will be valuable to the teams that they're on eventually down the road. These guys just weren't getting any any chance. They weren't getting a shot. Crosley Katz, for example. Freddie Scruggs, he's a decent player, 2478B. Bo Whitfield, White, Whitfield actually, I almost said Whitefield. It's Whitfield. But yeah, it's just felt like, you know, in this season when we're trying to create a little bit more chaos, it just kind of made sense to let the chaos ensue, <laughs> if you will. So some some teams got better, some teams lost a player, but they also gained a player, right? So that's how I that's how I kind of look at it here. Um, I think teams addressed positions that they lost, like Frank Monzo. Like the Grizzlies lost a couple pitchers in the Rule Five, and they get Frank Monzo. So it's like it's just shuffling deck chairs. I mean, everybody's different. Each player has different potential. Each player offers a little bit different. Um, repertoire in their game, if you will. Lavernia Sturridge is a custom player that never got a shot with the Miami Moonshots. Miami actually had a chance to take him again and protect him again, and they didn't. So they allowed the San Diego Gauchos to come in there and take him with the very next pick. Joel Cardona was another player that got traded away to, um, I believe it was New Orleans, actually. So they never really gave him a shot either. So I just think it's just giving teams, giving players another chance and uh, teams finding guys that they really like that they want to give a chance to, right? So Rule 5, those guys will definitely be playing. So now for Richmond, I'm looking at this as an opportunity for us to dip our toes into that Rule 5 selection pool here. And, you know, honestly, I'm looking at how many decent players that there are on the board. I don't want to take anybody that's kind of old, 31, 31 plus. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm looking for a good potential. I'm looking for a position player that is going to fill a gap for us but honestly we don't have a ton of gaps to be quite honest with you 
Third base could be an option for us. We've already got Domingo Mejia. We traded for him to be the kind of the heir apparent at third base behind Ricky Holbrun. But that guy's looking pretty good. Ronan Henderson, he's looking pretty good too. I love the vision. I love the contact ratings. He might be the, the actual heir apparent there. I mean, we've also got Mejia can play second and shortstop too. So there's an option there for him. But I, I think we might have a platoon at third base. There's been talk. We're going to shift Holbrun over to first base. KJ is going to shift out to right field to take over Connor Altman's spot. Ricky's just a little bit better defensively than KJ is, and I think if we're really going to give the old guy Manning the, the hot corner out there in Ricky Holberman, I think you're just asking for it. He's made some really great plays there, but he's also made a lot of bad plays with his speed rating as being as low as it is lately these days. Outfield is a potential spot too. We were looking at a couple players like Woodrow Seavers, Adding another pitcher like Tobias Hempill, not the greatest overall rating, but he does have some B potential. I kind of like what he's bringing to the table as a left-handed arm. Wood receivers, I've always liked him. He was a part of a year one trade for New Orleans, but we're not going to go that way. We're going to select Ronan Henderson as our man to be on the Rule 5 uh, selection here. So he's on the team now. He's on the team, and uh, he, he will be platooning with Domingo Mejia. Mejia, of course, bats left-handed, and Ronan bats right-handed. So Woodrow Seavers, I like him, but I really wanted to see him do something with New Orleans, and fortunately, they never gave him a shot. He's going to try his hand out there with Minnesota, and we just see a little slow scroll here for the rest of the Rule 5 draft. Richmond, I'm not going to dip my toes yet again in this in round two, round three. I just went ahead and just simmed it even further. Now, if I could make every selection for every team, I would have. But, you know, me controlling Richmond, I felt like that was fair. It's been done that way since season one. I'm kind of making the calls, making the decisions there, calling people up, making trades, that type of thing. But most of the trades, of course, have been community approved, just FYI. So we're done with the Real 5 draft, and all of the free agents, the exclusive guys, have signed up with their teams. Now the list is clear. It's clean. It's ready to get autoed. And as you guys can see, the early results here of autoing free agency is not really going to plan. I was hoping that I would see a little bit more action here. And some random players like Ryan Shannon, he's pretty good at 79A. So he's a pretty a pretty penny out there being sought after by a lot of guys. Felipe Marquez getting some love, getting some interest there. D'Angelo Waters, it's kind of random to me, a 77 overall C potential pitcher. I don't really get that. Tyson Cobb, Pineda, Clemente. <clears throat> Clement, Heath Calvert. So now we're starting to get some action here with the top players, but a lot of people are liking Chris Pena, Seattle, San Diego, San Francisco, Carlos Cairo getting some love. I'm surprised that Delman Marsh isn't getting a lot of love either. This guy went 5-17, and 17, so what's up with that? Delman Marsh, he won a championship with Columbus. So it's just interesting. Terry Goff, you know, there's there's been players like Cedric Rich, Mitch Tony, Bobby Gardner, guys that we've seen in gameplay that have done some things, right? They've made a name for themselves inside this series over the last four seasons. Andrew Doby, like, he's not getting any love. Look at the contact rating for him. The vision. I think it's just because of the age, the service time. He's starting to get up there a little bit. So you know what? I'm going to go after him. Richmond's going to go after him. Let's give him some love. I've loved Andrew Doby in gameplay. I think he's going to do wonders for us as a platoon guy at first base for with Ricky Holberman. I think that that would be awesome because he bats right-handed and Ricky's right-handed, but you got two old guys kind of duking it out there. He's going to be a bench player. He might be even a DH at that point. So Tyson Cobb, the biggest free agent of this season, signs with Washington. That's a huge get. So Washington is tired and sick of missing the postseason they got to get back to that level that they were at in season one they also signed lou jernigan if you guys remember lou jernigan he was a integral piece to that columbus cardinals team that won the championship there uh back in season number three and then uh, they also signed cesar pacheco the swamp monsters did so on this slow scroll delman marsh going to the revolution avery clement going to the swamp monsters already i'm kind of seeing a pattern columbus is a big winner here in the offseason. They, of course, lost John Choi to Michigan, but getting themselves Xavier Hawkins. They're addressing some things in free agency on, on autopilot. 
Washington is a winner in a free agency. They got Bruno Zapata as well. The Cardinals again, Andrew Glass, Swamp Monsters again, Sean Coronado. So I keep seeing the same teams popping up here. Look at Lee Belliard, Britt McClendon, Peter Rosa for the Cardinals. They get Terrell Bullock over here. So it's it's just the same teams over and over and over again. Willie Lamar going to the Swamp Monsters. So it's obvious to me, the winners of the offseason so far, Cardinals and Swamp Monsters. Those are the big teams, I think. And then San Francisco, not too much action here in auto free agency, but they did get Trey Mashburn. They got some other pieces in the Rule 5. So I think that they've done themselves uh, pretty well here. The good boys got a relief pitcher, Eddie Drummond. He was also a auto signing, signing guy. I did not do that myself. I was just really going after one guy, Andrew Doby. I think that that's fair. <laughs> Everything else all autoed up. And those are your results, guys. The Reapers ended up getting uh, Ryan Shannon. So he came over from the Los Angeles Knights, 79A potential player. So here's a little slow scroll now, guys. we got about 11 more minutes until this video is done. I'm going to go over all the lineups here first. Of course, this is going to change once I enter into spring training. But this is kind of where I'm seeing how the lineup is going to fit and how it's going to look like for each team. This is, of course, after setting up each, each team's 26-man roster. And then we're going to look at the pitching rotation as well. So if you want my early prediction, if, of course, I can match these things up with, you know, after spring training, if I can match it all up again, I, I think I think Pittsburgh is going to be very competitive this season, but the AL East is a, is kind of a gauntlet. You got Michigan, you've got New York. Pittsburgh's going to be competitive, like I said. Then you've got Washington, who is much better. They saw the writing on the wall here. They knew exactly who their big time opponent was. I think it's going to be Washington and Michigan just kind of duking it out between each other. When you get John Choi into the mix, you got Bellamy Bloodworth in the mix, you got Hawkins, the, the pitching staff for Michigan is going to be nutsos. They're going to be really, really good. Unfortunately for the Central, though, I think it's Columbus's division yet again. I think when you look at that roster, it's just way too good. It's way too loaded. And uh, what's interesting here is that they have Hawkins as a shortstop and McQueen as a bench player. So I don't really like that. He's McQueen's definitely going to be the shortstop. I think I'm going to move Hawkins out there to the outfield. Now for Iowa and Chicago, unfortunately, I don't think that those two teams did enough, but Iowa did, they did some things though. They got Eddie Pedroza, they got Leonardo Sosa. So they added some players from some veteran pieces from across the league, but I just don't think it's enough. Wisconsin could be competitive in that division, but I think again, it's it's just a it's just a one man race at this point. It's Columbus all the way. I don't even think Minnesota did enough at all. Despite they made some they made enough moves to 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 get back on the radar, if you will, getting Jack Riddle and some other guys there, and of course Johnny Redmayne is pretty good. But yeah, I just don't think it's anybody else but Columbus. Now for the West, the West, the West is a CF. It's a cluster. <laughs> to to be. To be quite honest with you, it's crazy. Anything can happen in the West. Of course, we've seen Colorado be successful. We've also seen them crap the bed. We've seen Oklahoma City be 50-50. They've been on and off. We've seen Phoenix kind of dominate. Probably Phoenix has been the most consistent team in the AL West. I'd probably just go with them. But, of course, we saw OKC beat Richmond in the Gold Series to win the whole dang thing. So they, they've got, I think the number was like 690 overall players in their starting nine it's crazy so they're good i like them again i think that they're going to be competitive yet again i don't think Miami's going to do too much here even despite getting jj cabrera in the east i think atlanta sting will be pesky i think richmond might end up taking a step back if you want my honest opinion even though we got ronan henderson we got domingo mejia we added to the offense, we added to the defense there. I just think that we might be taking a step back this season. I don't know. I just It's just how I'm feeling, man. But Orlando, they might be up and coming there in the East, too. Marshall Langston lead them off. 99 vision. Great player. Um, of course, losing a Ruby Moya probably doesn't help you, but they did add Josh Adams to the offense. Carolina might be a little bit better, too, although I think that they're just mis missing a couple of pieces on offense. Now moving to the Central. Uh, basically, the, the East, I think it could be anybody's division. I was, probably still would go Richmond, but I think it could be anybody. It's it's kind of 
it's very it's more well rounded than it has been in the in the last couple of seasons. Now for the Central, looking at Kansas City, I've liked them for years. They just haven't got it done. Um, looking at Houston, I still like their lineup, but now they're missing Andrew Doby. They do get Kinney and Joey Bing together, so that's obviously a really good tandem. And then you've got New Orleans here that I just think is they're they're still grinding, man. They're still grinding to try to get there to be a competitive team. They're, they'll be pesky too, but I think it's also St. Louis's division. I think that they'll they'll find a way to get it done. Now for the West, this might be the toughest division in all of the GGBL in season number five. You got Vancouver, who I've always liked, but they don't have one 90 overall player in that lineup, so that's obviously a concern. You got Seattle. You've got a much improved LA Knights team. You got San Diego, the Gauchos, who are always tough. Look at how many 90s they got in that lineup. Of course, we know the names by now. Kane, Connor Murphy, one rookie of the year, Nacho Molina. But then you got the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies are sneaky. They got Mashburn, they got Pierce, they got Bonds that's on the up and up. They got Vega, a decent pitching staff. I think that the Grizzlies might be somebody to mess with. Not to mess with, right? If if you want to mess with them, if you want to take them as your Dark Horse team, talk about them, mess with them, hang with them. But teams inside that NL West, you don't want to mess with them. That's my point. <laughs> I think the Grizzlies could make some noise this season. Out of nowhere. Now for the pitching staff. I still like in the East, I think it's Michigan. They've got the pitching staff. They've got the names. Bloodworth, Choi, Hawkins, Mitchell, Donnellan. You can't really beat that. Plus the bullpen is really darn good. I think that they they're they're the team to beat. Yeah, I hate I hate saying that. I mean, I'm a Michigan guy. Obviously, that's where I live, so I kind of have an affinity to the Mallards a little bit. But looking at Washington and what they've done, Michigan has not done what Washington has done. You know what I mean? So it's hard for me to go against Washington that they have the names, they've got the 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 pieces to do something, but I think Michigan by the numbers on paper, they seem like they should be the ones to uh, to do it. But now for the Central, again, I just don't see it. Like, we already looked at the, the lineups there. We already saw the bench. But I'm looking at the pitching staffs here, and I just I go back to it. I think it's Columbus. I just I just think that they've got it. You want to watch out for Ijarika here. Anyabuchi. He was drafted a couple seasons ago and has really skyrocketed up in that farm system for Minnesota. So watch out for him. And, of course, you go out to the West, and, and you look at OKC. And Carson Sova definitely replacing Johnny Hammer, who has had a terrible, terrible career, but he somehow still has a job. <laughs> Las Vegas, I think they have the worst pitching staff in the entire GGBL. That's just me. I just don't think they have the names. I think when you lose Cheltenham, you lose Avery Clement to Washington, that's not good for you. But then in the West, you've got Phoenix, who they've got the lineup, they've got the pitching staff. I think that they're the team to beat in the West. After seeing it all and putting it all together in the West, I think that they're probably the team to beat. Despite OKC winning the championship, I think that that's the case. Now, you look at Richmond's pitching staff. We are a one-man wrecking crew. It's James Monroe. That's it. Like We have some solid pitchers in the rest of our starting five, but by comparing to the other NL East teams, I think that they have better staffs. You've got Nettles, Cheltenham, Bruce Don, Olivo, Quiroz. I mean... We're not really where we used to be with our pitching staff. It's just I think that that's what used to be a strength for Richmond. I think it might be a hindrance for us this season. So we're really going to need the offense. Now for the Central, you guys kind of know my feelings about this. Houston's going to be solid. Nashville, Nashville in New Orleans probably going to be the two worst teams in that division, I think. I'm looking at my boy here, Lorenzo Zanetti. That's my custom player looking to carry New Orleans. I think he'll probably have more losses than wins, though, with that team. But you look at St. Louis, they still are stacked in that starting five. I think that it's their division to lose. And then the NL West, you've got Vancouver, who's got a really good staff with kicks, deals, Joey Warren. But then Seattle, obviously very good with Shevchuk, Hemingway, and their cast and crew. you got San Diego here with a decent staff as well. So you put it all together, I think the West is probably the toughest division in all of the GGBL. So all in all, I think it's going to be a really fun season in simulation. We're going to sim all the way to the trade deadline, get an update, and then we're going to turn trades onto auto. So you want more chaos? We'll have more chaos. So trades will be autoed, and then we'll kind of get a feel for who are buyers, who are sellers, and then that'll kind of reset the league 
even more so than we already did here in the off season. So I think that that'll be fun. Then of course, when we get to the GGBL Gold Series, then from that point, we are going to get into gameplay. So I'm gonna simulate the divisional round, the championship round, the wild card, all that stuff will be simmed, keeping up with how we're trying to plan out this entire season five, it's all simulated. But then when we get in the Gold Series, the last round of the playoffs, that will be done in gameplay. So we're gonna have at least a little bit of gameplay to determine the true champion. I always like teams to earn it that way. So that's how we'll run it. So guys, leave a like if you like this thing. I will see you in the next one. As always, thank you so much for watching. Post in the comment section below who you like this season to make it all the way, or just give me your playoff teams. I'm interested to know that. I'll see you in the next one, guys. As always, thanks for watching, and peace.